My guest today is Ria Lina, who is a comedian, actress and writer. You might have seen her on Mock the Week or The World Stands Up. We had a chat all about her background and how she found her way into comedy and what it's been like surviving as a comedian through lockdown. I'll be honest, when they announced lockdown, I was secretly quite pleased <laughs> because because I really like my I really like being at home like I love I love wearing sweatpants all the time and not having to worry about what I look like and I love all of that so there's you know we all have different aspects to ourselves don't we we've got you know who we are at home and who we are at work and and when you're you know in the stand-up world there's you know I have to think about my appearance and I have to think about make sure I'm not saying anything that someone's going to record and then put online and I get cancelled and there's so many different things to think about and in lockdown like true lockdown let's put zoom gigs aside and where the industry's gotten to in the last year which is amazing but in true lockdown at the beginning beginning where everyone was just on their own with their own thoughts with a nice bit of sun because I don't know if you remember but April was quite a nice month weather wise mm. at least where I was in London that it was like and then the government and you knew you knew because it was such a huge global issue that the government wasn't going to let us all you know that there would be some kind of safety net and so knowing that that we were all in this shit together uh, it was actually quite relaxing and quite exciting in a way. Yeah, I, that was the thing for me. I felt guilty saying it, but I was sort of thinking, well, this is just different. I'm interested by this because the rules are changing. The goalposts are moving every day. So it's kind of like, I don't know, it's exciting to sort of see how everyone adapts to it. Obviously, there's the dark side to it. I don't want to belittle that, but there's a lot of positives for individuals where you can get different kinds of work done and you can sort of, I had all these experiences of, getting back in touch with people I hadn't spoken to for ages just because everyone sort of sat around you got the time to do it so I think there has been obviously you know some pretty big pluses to it I th I definitely think that there are people coming out of this year in a healthier better place than they were and I'm again like yourself I am not belittling there are a lot of people who have struggled in many ways not just directly COVID related but isolation related mental health related like I don't poverty related I don't wish to belittle any of that but there's certainly been for some people room for growth and I think that it's very interesting to see who's done what and who's responded how to this because I think that's as much an interesting study of humanity of, of, of human nature to make as everything else Exactly, and I think it's interesting, I've spoken to a few comedians over lockdown, and I've listened to plenty of comedy podcasts as well, and I find there's quite a, a split down the middle of like, oh, I'm never doing Zoom gigs, I'm not doing that at all, I'm doing other stuff, I'm going to write, I'm going to stay away from it and just come back when they're ready. And then the other side is people like yourself, who's like, oh no, I'm going to do shows, I'm going to do Mock the Week with glass in between each person on the stage, and all that kind of thing, so... Is that was that an easy decision where you were just like yeah obviously I'm going to go straight for it well I, there's two different decisions there one is do you do zoom gigs and the other is when mock the week calls do you say yes or no um, and I think the mock the week one is a no-brainer uh, regardless of the circumstances whether they're you know they're obviously you know yes we have to be separated and socially distanced and we're not allowed to talk to each other outside of they kept us all very separate we each had our own dressing room you couldn't use the same toilets it was all very isolated to keep us healthy and safe uh, but you still say yes. <laughs> if, they, if they go, would you like to come on? You don't go, thank you, but I think I'll wait until the live audience is back. You, you grab that opportunity. Oh, I, I don't know if I could do it without real people in the room. Uh, but, but that said, having done Zoom gigs up to that point, that really helped because I think it would have been a bit of a culture shock if you decided, you know what, I'm not going to do Zoom gigs and then to walk into the studio and have them tell you, so we've got 400 people at home watching you. Here's a screen and they'll all be represented on that one screen over there. I think that would have been quite a culture shock. Zoom gigs, uh, yes, there are people who have embraced it and people who haven't embraced it um, for various reasons and I appreciate that. Uh, I certainly have... You know, if I think back to where I started, where I was, I can't even remember. I, I mean, I have now a whole desk set up. I never had a desk before. I have a desk now. I sit at my desk most days and do work like a grown up. I never had that before lockdown. And so I, I think probably my first Zoom gig, I had my laptop on my desk or maybe stuck it on top of a couple of boxes of toys so that it would be at the right height, you know, and, and um, I think I bought 
one of I had one of those cloths. Do you remember you would hang sort of Indian pattern cloths at university <laughs> yeah. to cover the walls? <laughs> you know, I had one of those in the background to cover cover my, you know, the, my wardrobe, which is what was behind me. Uh, you know, and it was that kind of cobbled together situation where I had a desk lamp pointing at my face. And now I've got a full green screen curtain that hangs behind me and a proper mic and a proper camera. You know, all the evolution over a year where you've gone, I am embracing this and the technology. Um, and it's and it has it has meant that I could make a living as a comic in the last couple of months as people as you know, as promoters caught up and people caught up to it. It has meant that I've been able to stay in my lane as opposed to retrain, which is what Rishi Sunak wanted us all to do, was yeah. retrain. <laughs> it's weird to think, it's weird to hear you use the word retrain because you've sort of retrained to be a comedian, haven't you? Because you studied virology, you're a PhD in virology. I do have a bit of a science background, but yeah. if I'm honest, I believe that true comics always were. If I look back on my childhood and the things that should have been hilarious in the classroom, if I, 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 I had a great wit in high school, you know, there were things if I'd said them, I knew people would laugh if anyone other than me said them. Do you know what I mean? Like it, they, it would have been funny, except it was being said by that geeky little brown girl in the corner that no one was going to give that kind of credit to. Oh. So I, I think that, I think that I ended up being a comedian because I was always supposed to be one as opposed to the idea that I was a scientist and I pivoted to be a comedian instead. What do you think stopped people laughing at your jokes at that age? Do you think that was just a racial thing? Oh no, it wasn't race. It was it was very much in crowd, out crowd. It was that whole hierarchy of high school. You, you know, it, mean girls and and clueless and all of those things. I went to an American high school. That's why I have an American accent. So I went to an American high school in the Netherlands and even though there were only 66 people in my entire class in my entire grade that I graduated with there were still the jocks and there were still those that would have been cheerleaders if we had cheerleaders you know you still had all of those groups and I was the geeky little nerd in the corner and as witty as anything I could have said what would have been it's not what you say it's who said it that's terrible to think because it's sort of it must change because there's loads of people on the comedy circuit who have backgrounds in science and medicine and things like that. And it's like, you know, you just haven't found your people yet. And it's obviously a bit more difficult when you're a kid to deal with being, oh, well, you don't, you're not cool enough to be funny. You know, I suppose that ends up giving you the confidence to go out and do stand up because you sort of think, no, mm. I know I'm funny. I just need to go and find the, find the right people to tell my jokes to. I think it's the other people, though. It's not that loads of people in comedy or science background. I think it's loads of people in comedy were also the the loner or the bullied person in school. I think that's the that's the community, isn't it? Is all the the different, you know, the I don't want to say weirdos, but when I came to comedy, one of the things that really resonated with me is how everybody already in comedy was broken or dysfunctional in some way in real life but were completely and utterly functional in comedy. You know, people who couldn't hold down jobs or couldn't keep stay in relationships or couldn't, you know, you know parent their children or whatever it might have been or, or maybe struggled with mental health, whatever it was, uh, it made them better comics, even as it made them unable to do, quote, real life as it was expected to be done at that time. When you're working through a bachelor's a master's a phd that's years and years of education the whole way through that were you thinking i wish i was just doing comedy or was it something that came a bit later it was concurrent it was actually concurrent i fell into if i'm honest i didn't you know i didn't look at comedy and go i want to be a comedian i had a couple of eddie Izzard vhs's growing up and i well they were my parents vhs's and i remember taking them to university with me and watching, you know, those were my go-tos. Uh, you know, I grew up with Victor Borg. I grew up with Victoria Wood and the two Ronnies and Morgan and Wise. Like, this was my education in comedy. But I never once looked at them and thought, I, c I could be them. And then in my first degree at St. Andrews, they went... And St. Andrews was very isolated at the time. It doesn't have a train station. It gets dark at 3 o'clock. It's, it's, it's out there, okay? It's out there, and, and, and it's where all the Oxbridge rejects go. 
I'm, I am an Oxbridge reject. I will admit that now. <laughs> That's where we go when we go, oh my gosh, we failed our offer to Oxford Cambridge. We better go to the third best university. It's St. Andrews and it's far away and no one will know. And then you show up and everybody knows. Everybody's looking at you. Oh, did you fail Cambridge? No, Oxford. Yeah, yeah, yeah me too. Me too. Um, <laughs> and, and so half the university is, well, half of the, of the English people failed Oxbridge. The Scottish go there because they're Scottish and 50% of it's Scottish. And they're just like, I'm here because it's down the road. And, you know, why would I go to England? Puh, puh. Uh, damn them uh, freedom and and the other half are English people half of whom failed Oxbridge and the other half are like the bastard children of their lord and lady fathers and their mistresses so it's a really eclectic <laughs> mix and then you throw in a couple of you know co- throw in a couple of overseas students to pay the bills so it, you know I went there and and they so we had to make our own entertainment because no one would come on tour to St. Andrews. It was just too out of the way. They'd hit Edinburgh, they would hit Dundee, and they would completely skip St. Andrews. So we were like, oh, okay, we better play to each other. And one person came the entire time I was there. There was one person who came on tour, and it was Craig Charles. And it was just after those sort of like iffy stories about him. Yeah, oh no. So, so we all kind of went, well, we're going to go because there's nothing else to see, but we're going to boo. We're, you know, we're not going to totally <laughs> embrace this. We're going we're gonna to sit there and go, uh not sure um so one night one day in somebody said why don't we do a stand-up comedy night why don't we all just do some comedy and no other women would volunteer so i went yeah i'll do it and in fact i only was willing to do it if no other women would do it because you know scarred scarred from high school the last thing i needed was to be compared to an actual proper person like a proper woman i needed to just be the only one i needed them to go oh my god you know the way that nerds go she's so sexy and it was like she's the only one you know that's why you like her you know uh and so i i did that night and it actually went well and that's where i got my taste for it there's a certain there's a certain feeling when you stand on stage and command a room to laughter because laughter is a vulnerability it in a, it is a vulnerability and it's a vulnerability and it's a trust thing when people allow you to make them laugh it's a huge amount of power it's sort of like i mean it, it's not exactly like if you know if someone says hey i'm willing to get naked and have sex with you but that is another form of vulnerability but it is certainly something that alcohol helps with we all know that alcohol helps a comedy night mm-hmm. because it loosens inhibitions it loosens it it frees people up to feel more comfortable to do that and so there is a an addiction to being given that power and that trust and to be good at it. And that's where I got my first taste of it. So when the next year they said, hey, remember that thing we did last year? Why don't we do that again? Because in those days, once a year was enough for comedy. Uh, You didn't want more than that. And so the next year I did it again. And that was me, that was me hooked. So that after I finished my bachelor's and moved to London to do my PhD, I decided, you know, while doing the PhD, I continued to do the open mic circuit. So they they sort of happened at the same time. So at the same time as I finished my PhD and published my thesis and and passed my Viva, I was also already doing weekends at the store and um, pregnant with my first kid. And, you know, so I had at that point, there was a crossroads and one way pointed to more science and the other way pointed to working 20 minutes a day. Now, which would you choose? Do you remember what you were talking about on stage when you first started out like that? I probably have somewhere in the depths of my boxes the, the, the first set I ever did. And I think that in the first year, so they kind of merged in my head because we did it in exactly the same venue and it was a lot of the same people. So I don't have a clear recollection of which was the first set and which was the second set. Uh, but definitely I did some jokes about picking which stall to use in the women's bathroom. I remember that (laughs) looking, you know, when we always, when you go in, there's always multiple stalls in the women's bathroom and you always have to check two or three of them before you use one. You don't just go into the first one. Like you'll go in, you'll have a look, you'll come out again and you might end up back in the first one, but you always have to check two or three, make sure you've got the best one. Okay, because there's obviously differences, um, even though they built them the same. And, oh, okay. and then and there's also always one with the toilet seat up, which now with the way that we are far more open to to um, 
gender fluidity is not is not as big a deal but back then it was a big deal every time you went in and there's one with the toilet seat up you're going why is the toilet seat up in the middle of the day like who put the toilet seat up what woman touched the toilet seat uh, so there's definitely a joke about that and then there was also jokes about i don't know if you remember this this was all the rage it was quite outrageous at the time but uh the eu would not import bendy bananas there was a degree I do, to I which... I think I remember hearing about that in the news, yeah. Yes. So, uh, strawberries could only could not be square, but bananas and cucumbers could not be bendy. And so I did a whole thing about... I remember doing something about that. Nowadays, you'll speak much more personally about your own life and matters of home and, and race and things like that. Did it take a lot of practice to be able to open up on stage like that? Or did that sort of... When you were doing it more regularly, that just came out? It's actually kind of a full circle. Um, I used to, you know, I, it's funny actually now that you've asked that question. It's funny that I did do topical material back then because then when I went into open mic land, and in open mic land you do tend to talk about yourself and there's a number of reasons for that. And now that I'm where I'm at again, I'm back to talking about topical stuff, which has always been my interest. I love talking, you know, topical comedy is my favorite and, and you know, The Daily Show and watching anybody that can come up with intelligent analysis on the fly and I think that's part of it is the fact that your material is constantly changing your source material is changing what can you do with that cross references callbacks I, th I think that topic for me topical material is a wonderful way to really practice and and manipulate and get good at this particular art form of stand-up but when you're an open spot uh, there there are hierarchies and there are statuses and and I've seen it time and time again over many years, but you have to have status to be able to tell people about politics. Audiences are not that open to hearing someone that they don't rate very highly in the skill set that they're performing in tell them what they should think. Right, okay. But, uh, you know, to, to put it bluntly or bottom line. So we tend to, as Open Spot, and, and also write what you know, when you get on stage you know you need to establish who you are help the audience understand yourself if you know why do you why do I look this way why do I talk this way these are these are questions that people often have for me in everyday life so it made sense as an open spot when I've only got five minutes to to explain that um, and and it wasn't for a long time and also this comes down to your ability in your art form. If you're good at stand-up, people are more willing to go, okay, tell me what your political ideas are. But if you're really bad at it, nobody wants to be lectured by someone screaming at you thinking it's funny. Exactly. So that's why people tend to, you know, and it's degrees of, of uh, it's the spheres. It's the degrees of the spheres away from yourself. When you start off as a stand-up again, you write what you know. You write about yourself, and you might start writing about your family or your experiences, or or walking down the street, or going to the supermarket. And then it expands even further to what do I have to say about the world stage? And so those are the the degrees at which you can write as you get more confident. And if I were teaching someone, I would always recommend start close. Start with what you know you have an authority to speak on. If you are Jewish, please do tell me about your experiences. I would love to hear that from you. I cannot speak about being Jewish. I cannot speak even nowadays very much about the Jews or even question or ask those questions because we're very, very sensitive to that. So if you are Jewish, please do speak on that because people are interested and, and, and it's important to have that conversation. Likewise, if, if you're of a particular ethnicity or sexuality, all of that applies. But then as we get to, you know, we know Alan Carr is gay we know that we don't need to hear him talk about it because we know that so we can hear him speak on other things because that's been established for us okay so you think in being a comedian there's an element of trying to answer questions that people aren't comfortable enough to ask there can be and i think i think that that's one of the lines that you that you walk along isn't it that's the line that you tread between acceptability and ooh saying something that you couldn't say in polite company but we can get away with it because we're in stand up comedy that's that's a little bit of it i'm not i'm not advocating necessarily for shock tactics or edge comedy which is where people specifically say things to get a negative reaction but but yes there's a lot of things that i think especially in british culture which is why comedy works so well in britain why we have such a rich um, circuit and a rich uh, community is because so much is unsaid. British, the Brits are f famously passive aggressive, 
uh, and and everything is is never said to your face but behind your back or or, or hinted at or it, and everything else and that's why comedy works because when you take someone that's never going to admit something to your face and you say it to their face priceless huh? yeah. isn't it priceless we love that and in fact we have a lot of cringe humor that doesn't exist anywhere else I mean we you know that's what Britain often Nighty Night by Julia Davis classic cringe humor even The Office the British version of The Office and some of those elements translated into the American version there's a there's that element of cringe to it and we put that under the umbrella of comedy not tragedy I wanted to check if it's actually something you're really allowed to talk about is the sitcom that you've been optioned for is there is that worth talking about or is it sort of too early days (laughs) <laughs> it is really early days. It's actually evolved. So the the sitcom, um, the sitcom as it was uh, optioned originally, and it's evolved so much since then. I, I can tell you the the basics of it. But it's about a, a female, a woman with autism. Okay. Uh, and I wrote it with originally I wrote it with another woman. We're both autistic, and we wanted to write a sitcom that starred two autistic women. That's proving to be a lot for the industry to to take on board. They're like, okay, I can see one, but why why two? And I was like, because there are more than one of us in the world. Yeah, it's just it is a thing. It's the same way you have more like more than one white woman in a show because there's more than one of you. And they sort of go, yeah, but can we really get to the bottom of who she is if someone else is there? And I'm like, <laughs> again, I point to two white women. Let's look at Friends. Three of them. Mm. Oh my gosh, that's insane! Three People white women to in one show. That, didn't they? I know, and we can tell them apart. We can tell which one is, you know, Phoebe, and which one is Monica, and which one is Rachel. Every scene, it's they do it so well. They do it so well. <laughs> but, um, but uh, actually, my writing partner gifted me the project, and she said um, she was moving on to other things, and so it has evolved into it's 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 evolving into uh, something else, which just stars the one character. Uh, and fundamentally what I want it to I hate this word and it's an inappropriate to use in the circumstance but I don't know a better one please tell me normalize to normalize to to help people recognize what autism in women looks like because it is woefully uh, underdiagnosed and, and very much just as women have women have this problem across the medical sciences of being taken seriously and diagnosed appropriately and so it's just what I thought if there's one way that I can make a recognizable character that people can go oh okay I've seen that before oh I see that's what it looks like then that that would be a, a good a great ambition for me to achieve that sentence just petered out that sentence just went I don't know what happened there the words just went ah. this question is uh, this is something I ask everyone I speak to and it's uh, it's called hidden gem most people lean towards choosing things from their own industry how left wing I mean are, you want me to stick to the arts um what's well what, what, what comes to mind if you do don't you know what comes to the arts? okay what genuinely comes to mind is raisins in savory foods. <laughs> I've never had anyone suggest a food. Is I've had yeah, as I say, I've had books and I've had albums and you know I think I've had a couple of films, things like that. But yeah, fair enough. I I love I hate raisins in like scones and cake. Cannot stand them. Love raisins in savory food, and. I, and and I know a lot of people. If if you put this in, will be like, no, that's it. I I can't even I can't even with the rest of this episode. But it's incredible. So uh, I first my parents used to make like a moussaka, you know, sort of a Greek dish with eggplant. Uh, sorry, aubergine and uh, mince. Uh, it's, so a tomato based sauce with mince and uh, aubergine and raisins. And it's incredible how you know you put them in early and they puff up. So they don't have the same consistency as that kind of hard, chewy raisin that you're used to straight out of the out of the snack box. They kind of puff up as little bursts of sweetness, sort of like a, and and, and I put them in everything now. Couscous with roasted vegetables, put a bunch of raisins in there. Um, any any just love it. Ria, how can we keep up to date with what you do and watch your Zoom gigs and all sorts of things like that? Uh, yes, I am basically 
all over the social medias, so find me on there. Um, I tend to spend most time on Instagram, so that's where I will put news of gigs and things like that in my stories, and that'll push through to Facebook if that's your thing. I will try and be better on Twitter, especially if you tweet me and go, Rhea, I'm following you on Twitter specifically for news. I'll be like, oh, I, I owe that person, and I need to I need to make sure that I put it out on Twitter. And then there's always my website, which has a list of gigs, Zoom or otherwise. Um, so that's realina.com. But come find me and like send me a message on any of them because I'm on there to talk to people other than those that I live with. So please do. Okay, great. Will do. I might even take you up on that myself. Oh, yeah, um, please. Cool. Well, thanks a lot for talking to me today, Ria. And I look forward to seeing you when uh, lockdown opens up finally. Yes, definitely. Let's, let's do a reunion in a beer garden or something. Mm-hmm.